Okay, I'd like to introduce uh, Dougal Matthews to you. <clears throat> okay. Dougal is currently one of our PyCon UK guys. Now, in two months' time, that may be different because he comes from Scotland. <laughs> and in contrast to Germany, which has unified, we seem to be possibly deconstructing in the UK. So after that, we may call it the disunited kingdom. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> Thanks, John. Cool. Um, yeah, so I'm a, a Pythonista and I'm a skier. That's like two of my favorite things. And as John said, I'm Dougal. I, uh, I live in Glasgow. Um, I am a developer at Red Hat, where I work on um, OpenStack sort of day to day. Um, and that's my Twitter. It's Dougal with a zero rather than an O. But um, yeah, and that's my, my GitHub and various other things as well. Um, but this project's nothing to do with work. This is obviously like a side project of mine, something I've been working on for around sort of six months on and off and that kind of thing. Um, so just sort of to talk about home automation, I'll first sort of define what it is about home automation that interests me, the things that I'm sort of aiming to do. Um, and I kind of like to split it into three different categories. So the first one's monitoring. It's like what is happening now in my house? Um, what, um, what is the temperature? Uh, how much electricity am I using right now? Um, the next one is historical data, so this is sort of collecting this over time and hopefully identifying trends and learning something from it and then adapting. Um, this one will take a lot longer to pay off um, and I probably don't quite have enough data yet because seasons change things so much um, and how you sort of behave. Um, and then the last one's pretty obvious, it's controlling. So it's like, I want to turn the lights on, I want to turn something off, I want to sort of turn off power sockets overnight because I'm not going to be using the TV in the, like between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. or something ever. Um, and you can just stop things using a bit of power on standby. Uh, so that's kind of the things I've been doing. Um, so yeah, then for my setup, uh, the, sort of the brains of operation at the moment is a Raspberry Pi. Um, I've actually bought a Beagle Bone Black that I'm going to move to just for a bit more uh, speed, essentially. Um, and then the sort of the core communication of everything is using uh, a device from a company called RFXCom, which is a TRX RFX uh, radio transceiver. So I use that for sending and receiving um, and sort of communicating between all these devices. It's a radio uh, device and it works on 433 uh, megahertz. Um, and one of the things that surprised me about getting into this is how many companies make devices which work on this um, frequency. Um, and that's been quite nice because I kind of figured I'd have to support a bunch of other things, but so far I've managed to avoid it. Um, I might look into Bluetooth Low Energy because it's quite neat, but for now it's not really on my radar fully. Um, so just to sort of quickly go through the devices and let you see what they are. This is what the, the actual radio thing looks like. Um, it's, it's not particularly attractive, but it works well. And it's, um, it's a serial device that, work, that uh, works over USB. Um, so you can just see the, the uh, micro USB input there. Um, and oh yeah, it works well, but the only thing I have issues, I, I live in like a really old house um, from like 1900, oh sorry, 1920s I should say. Um, and some of the walls really block the signals, but otherwise it's really good. Then for um, electricity, I use, uh, there's a company called Owl, and they make this device, which is the Owl CM160, I think. And basically, there's a little clip on the left that you can attach to the cable going to your uh, electricity meter. And then every minute, it sends out a packet which has got like the current watts and the total watts. Um, and then you can just pick this up. And I'll show you uh, that in a minute. Um, and you can get a display with it. It's, it's kind of, it's more expensive if you buy it with a display. So I'd, if you're actually quite serious about doing some of this stuff, I'd recommend not getting it. I got it originally because I wasn't sure if I'd get bored of this project. So I wanted to at least be able to see the data somewhere because um, otherwise it's, it's useless just having uh, radio waves. Um, then temperature humidity is again pretty boring in terms of looking at the device um, and it updates every minute again, sort of roughly, and it's, it just spits out the temperature and the humidity of wherever you have left it. I've got these kind of scattered around my house so you can kind of start to um, see what's going on in different rooms. Um, and then sockets and light switches from a company called Lightwave RF. Um, these are just remotely controllable, so you can turn them on and off. Um, I, oh, the one thing I should have made a bit clearer, um, 
So the, the electricity readings and the temperature and humidity, they are transmit only. You, they basically send a message and assume somebody is going to receive it. Uh, with the switches and sockets, they are receive only. Um, so you kind of have to send something and assume they've heard you. Um, and the way it works is you put them into a learning mode and you send a command with an ID. They remember that ID. And then if you send again with that ID, they will, they will listen to you. Um, so yeah, how this to kind of have a give you an idea of how um, how the what this sort of the data looks like. This is an example packet coming from one of the electricity devices. It's I'm kind of going through this stuff fairly quickly because it's I don't know it's not that interesting, but I didn't want anyone to have a like not really understand what I was using at all um, or like how it worked underneath. So it's, it's, that's the, the kind of takeaway from this bit. Um, so this is, it's an 18 byte packet, um, and there's, there's a sort of a similar standard for all of them, but they vary after the first four bytes. So the first byte, um, the X11 tells you that it's a 17 byte packet, so it's the length of the packet, but excluding the first byte. Um, and then 5A is the, so it's the hex for the, the, uh, the sort of the family of devices, so I know it's an electricity monitor. And then 01 tells me that it's that specific L. And then after that, it can vary depending on the first three sort of things. So you've got to really look into the um, spec, and that's quite hard to get your hands on. Um, the the guy who makes the uh, the RFX com, you can get the sort of the SDK, but you've got to sign an NDA for it, so you can't actually give out the the SDK to anyone else. Um, his reason being is he doesn't want anyone to ask him questions. It isn't a real programmer. Um, he just does not want to support this thing basically to anyone else. Um, yeah, and that, at the bottom there, that then just shows the actual extracted data from that packet. So the, there's the ID, the total watts, and the current watts. There's, that's basically all you get out from that. There's other things like battery level, but um, yeah, that, I mean, that's the interesting data. And with a system like this, we basically, the whole thing is like an event stream. Um, there's just stuff happening all the time. Um, and you just have to sort of react based on what, what's going on. So some of these are like incoming and some are outgoing. So the lights is like an outgoing thing. I'm sending that message to say I want to turn on a light. Then I get readings from a room, uh, sort of a thermometer in one room and so on. And then an electricity reading. And it just continues over and over, over and over. Um, so that's, that's kind of what drew me to something like AsyncIO. Um, well, actually, I, I kind of wanted an event loop. I wanted something where I could react on events. Um, and it seemed like quite an obvious match to me. Um, but then I wanted to play with new stuff. So that's what actually brought me to AsyncIO. And now we'll sort of move on to that part of the talk. Um, this is how the Python documentation describes AsyncIO. I personally don't find that a very useful description. It's kind of unless you are already familiar with a lot of the internal terminology, um, it's really, it's kind of confusing. Um, Daniel Pope done a talk earlier this week and he went into a lot of more detail in sort of event loops. It was actually, a, the title's a, a G event talk, but he went into a lot more detail about um, event loops and how sort of async IO works. So if you want to really understand that in a lot more depth, you should watch that and check out, there's a, some good talks by Guido on, on async IO as well. Um, it's fairly new, so there's not a huge amount out there, but there are, there are some good videos. Um, but basically, I sort of the the, the dumb, re, re, really dumbed down version of what an event loop is is it, that it dispatches, sorry, it waits for and dispatches events, and then calls an appropriate handler for that event. Um, oh yeah, and just sort of before I move on to this, because one of the things about Asyncro is it's Python 3. Do we, can I have a little a show of hands of who's using Python 3 at the moment? Sort of in, in work or anything like that? Okay, it's a small number. And keep your hand up if you have used Asyncio. All right, so that's probably about half the Python 3 people. So you're all on at least 3.3 then, so that's good. Right, um, yeah, so let's, let's look on some code. Uh, this first example, here is it's kind of a dumbed down example. Um, it's just Python, right? There's no nothing uh, non-standard here. This isn't async error yet at all. Uh, one of the things that Guido is sort of pushing for is that the async error code should just read like normal Python when you strip everything out. So I kind of proved this fact by going to the documentation, taking one of their async error examples, removed all the async error special bits, and it now just works like a normal um, normal bit of code. Um, so basically what we're doing here is we're, we've got a function which calls out to an expensive compute function and then we would get a result from that. So just to turn that into like a non-blocking operation, you just need to do a few minor adjustments. So you'll see here that we, 
Um, so we put on a decorator on each function, and then when calling the expensive, uh, sorry, when calling compute and when calling the sleep, we use the yield from. So basically, when that happens, we suspend the coroutine. So we'll go into print, we'll get to the result, and when it yields to compute, that will then be suspended. And then we go into the compute function, and then it is suspended when it gets to sleep. Um, and it kind of moves up and down the stack like that. Um, so I'll just quickly skip back again so you can kind of see the difference because it's really, it's fairly small. They're, they're really quite similar apart from the decorator, the, um, the yield from, and then there's a little bit down at the bottom which kicks off the event loop, which is kind of ugly, I think, but you only really do it typically once per app. Um, you can use multiple event loops, but that's a fairly advanced feature. Um, so to move on to something that's a little bit more relevant to what I've been doing, um, I never actually mentioned this device because um, it's really quite simple stuff, but the, I've got like a, a webcam which you can just access over the network. So you can just make a request to um, a URL, grab the image and then store it. And what I was trying to do is I wanted a recent image that I would just store and, um, and have it in a convenient place. So I update every five seconds and I just have one. It's, so when I want to view the live stream, that's fine, but I don't want to load that on every page. I want to like a nice recent image just to show in, um, someone browsing the website, which uh, I'll show later as well. Um, yeah, so basically I'm using here, I'm using the async IO. There's another library called AIO HTTP, which is like a async IO requests clone essentially. And then there's an async IO Redis library, um, which again is just like another, another library written for async IO to interact with Redis. Um, and it, this is actually one of the sort of the pain points that um, I find when working with async IO is you suddenly have to start looking for libraries which support the, the, pro the protocols and the way that it's working. So you've got to kind of rethink things and it's like you're suddenly back at a really small standard library, or sorry, not standard library, a really small ecosystem of things you can use that will be non-blocking. Um, but again, if you read this function, you will find that it's really fairly straightforward to read. So if you ignore the coroutine decorator and the yield from, it's a simple procedural code which would otherwise um, work as normal. But instead it's, it's, got, it's yielding to creating the connection, it's yielding to uh, downloading the image and then yielding to the, the Redis, so it's all uh, non-blocking. And then it just repeats every five seconds, so I'm just pulling down an image every five seconds that I've got stored in Redis, which is convenient. Um, although I, I actually, stopped using this approach. This is something I was just messing around with, but I thought it demonstrated quite well. There's a, a bunch of different libraries that are useful. Um, the, the main reason I was trying to do it is I, I didn't want to write to an SD card and a Raspberry Pi every five seconds and eventually burn the thing out. Okay, so um, Python RFXCOM is a, an async IO uh, based um, library for working with the, the radio device. So this is something that I've been writing um, there are other Python libraries for working with the RFXCOM, but there are no other async IO libraries. There's, some, there's one that uses Twisted, and I, I, they've actually done a reasonable abstraction for the transport protocol, so I, I did think about uh, just writing a different sort of transport for it. Um, but some of the code choices I, I kind of objected to, so I, I decided to write my own in a sort of a, a rage quit when it, it started suppressing errors. Um, but having, since I wrote this myself, it's fairly new and it's currently limited to devices I support. But um, it is working fairly well and I'm, I'm adding things when people are, are sort of helping me out with testing. So the, the problem I found is when I, I got into this, I was new to Async Cairo and I, I walked straight away into the, the callback trap. It's kind of like, the, the very simple model, and this, this gets kind of ugly easily. Um, in this particular app, it's really fairly simple. So I'm, I'm basically setting up the transport, I'm passing it the serial device I want to read, um, and the, the event loop I'm running on, and then the callback I want to be called. It works fine, um, but it just doesn't, it doesn't really feel very elegant, and it's, it, it, there's a sort of a, a bunch of pitfalls with callbacks, and you kind of, the biggest one really is it, it breaks out of your standard Python um, development flow. I'm still working on a better solution for this. And if there's anyone that's like uh, familiar with async IO, then I would love some help. The, the problem is some of the APIs are restricted to callbacks only. So I use the, the low level function for calling the file descriptors um, and that expects a callback. So I need to somehow go from, uh, I, want, I want this callback when I can read the uh, serial device, but then I want to move to uh, the set of the generators and futures. And I found that a bit tricky so far. 
Um, so this is showing another example. This is um, something that I've actually found quite useful with the yield from, is you can be more explicit about how you, sort of, um, when you yield to the event loop. It allows you to do a combination of blocking and non-blocking operations. So this is actually kind of pseudo-Python, um, which is just copied and then reduced down a bit from the code. Because when I'm doing the setup of the, the radio device, I need to reset it, and then I've got to wait a period of time and then send a, a status packet to check that it's ready. And if you get the timing of this wrong, it just doesn't work right. So I wanted to be more blocking in the way I was doing it, but then afterwards I wanted to not be blocking. So it kind of switches to then using the yield from where I set the mode, um, which is how I enable and disable different protocols. Um, and I, I'm not sure how you do something like this in, say, G event when you want to have a mixture of things when you've got um, the, sort of the monkey patching happening. Um, so for the, that's kind of like the data collection and how I've been working um, with that kind of thing and with the actual physical devices and then presenting the, the results on a dashboard that I've written. So it's a fairly simple web app um, and it's, it's kind of aside to the, 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 the bits I find interesting in the talk, so I'm kind of skip over this fairly quickly. Um, it uses Flask, Redis, SQL Alchemy, Bootstrap. Um, and basically it's just a way of viewing this data, sort of uh, graphing it. So I've, um, I've got like a sort of a simple time series which I implemented, although that turned out to be a, a big mistake, I have to say, to write your own. Um, and all the code for this is on my GitHub. Um, so if anyone actually wants to dive in or try and use it, they can do. The code is horrific. This has been kind of like the dashboard has kind of been like my play area and I'm slowly spinning stuff off to actually make more reusable stuff which is tested um, and not just terrible. Yep. So that last web app is not using SSI? No, yeah, that's kind of why I'm glazing over it. It's just, um, yeah, it doesn't, just for the, the mic, it doesn't use uh, Flask at all, which is the, sorry. It doesn't use async IO in the Flask web app. Um, yeah, so this is kind of the results of what I'm seeing. So this is just like the, the default view, which shows you the um, the 24 hour period of what's going on in my house. Um, I kind of cut it out to remove some of the sen more sensitive information, but you can get the idea. Um, so that's like the LTC uses aggregated over the day and at the top. And then that's the sort of the current readings at the bottom. Um, so you can kind of see things happening like when an oven's been turned or you're boiling a kettle, you get huge spikes. Um, and the, the one that I try and get down as low as possible is at the beginning, there's this sort of idle period where we're sleeping or we're not in the house. And that's really when you're wasting a lot of energy a lot of the time just because there's stuff being you, sort of the, the things are happening and you're not there to take advantage of it. And then just to show another graph, we've got the, this is humidity and temperature. It was in my lounge. It was like when we had a really hot period, we do have them occasionally in Glasgow. Um, and as the afternoon comes round, the sun goes right into the living room and it just like, you see the, the temperature rocket up. Cool. Okay, so to sort of move into some of the lessons I've been learning um, with this project, um, I'm finding Asenco is pretty nice to work with. Uh, but it does feel quite a low level. This is one of the actual points of it. They want, uh, the idea is to have further abstractions added on top. Um, so I'm hoping that, um, say, Twisted is probably going to support it, and that might aid their port to Python 3. I don't have a clue if they're actually doing that, but I'd be surprised if it's not on the cards at some point. Um, the ecosystem is young, so it's at the moment it's quite, it's quite tricky doing things. There's not a huge amount of examples or documentation out there. Um, so when you're learning about async IO, it's kind of tricky. And most people are doing are building like services or they're doing, I guess, network traffic and things. There's not really anyone else that I found doing sort of serial devices or messing around with these particular APIs. So if you go looking for examples in GitHub, I'll, I can find how to scrape websites. That's fine. But yeah, doing something like this doesn't isn't really that popular with Python 3.4, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, and the other sort of the key thing is I should have used Graphite um, for my, my data collection. Um, writing your own Redis time series is actually fairly easy, but it's just a bit of a pain in the ass if you want to maintain it. Um, and yeah, the reason I didn't, I was just being really lazy about actually getting set up and I just wanted something running. So I started just inserting data into Postgres and it's kind of slowly moved, but um, Redis on a Raspberry Pi is actually still amazingly slow. Um, okay. I think I've kind of touched on most other things, but the uh, the coroutines and futures is something that 
they, they, when you're working with them, they feel a lot nicer to work with. Um, so there were some in my examples, I, I probably didn't call them out that well, well they sort of the difference between the two. Um, but the problem with, as I was saying with the APIs is it's, it's hard to know how you can use callbacks in futures when the documentation is explicitly just defining only callbacks. So the kind of confusion between the two is a bit tricky. Um, and that's, uh, that really is about everything for me. So I went through that a little quick, but yeah, I'd be happy to take some questions if anyone has some. Have we any questions? Okay. Oh, uh, just, a, just a quick question. What sort of um, money is involved there in these uh, Oh, it's an expensive hobby. <laughs> um, 100,000, 10,000? Uh, I've spent a, a few hundred, I guess. I, I, would, I could actually go and find, I can give you links to all the devices if you want to find them there. They're pretty easy to buy on Amazon. Um, it's tricky knowing what is compatible, which is partly why I wanted to list everything at the beginning. Um, but yeah, it does get quite expensive because you're kind of like, oh, I could just buy another one of these. But yeah, it's an expensive hobby. So I'm, I'm definitely not saving money by cutting down my electricity usage yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, I have a question as well. Are there any suitable devices for monitoring gas consumption? So this is, this is kind of odd because there's, like, there's a, an area blocked out on the spec for it and there's actually, it's defined how it will work, but I can't find anyone selling them. Um, so I've been trying to think of creative ways to do this. The only option I've thought of is a webcam and OCRing the number, but that <laughs> seems a bit crazy. Hi, Diggle. Um, so, oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you've uh, wired up your house, your plugs um, <laughs> that you can ping, and uh, yeah. what about the security of all this? Um, um, so I could drive up by your house and switch everything off, perhaps. In theory, you could do some of that. The, so the range isn't that great on the, on the devices. Um, yeah, so if you sat outside and you listened to the packets I was sending, and then you, you just need to take the IDs, and then you could turn things on and off, you, you wouldn't know what you were turning on and off, necessarily. Well, that'd be kind of, kind of fun to, to, to watch the lights switch uh, on and off, wouldn't it? <laughs> I, I've, I've, um, one of my friends is, is um, doing a similar thing, but he's been doing it with uh, Node.js and stuff, and I was considering going out and like trying to troll him, just like setting up a Raspberry Pi with like a battery pack and things, take the car out next to his house and see. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and given that this talk is being live streamed on the internet and will be available on YouTube, you don't have any concerns about the... Uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I don't think I included my address, but... <laughs> <laughs> good point, good point. Thank you very much. Please. Um, what about higher level web frameworks and async IO? Do you know if anybody's doing any work on doing that sort of thing in Python um, at the moment and if there's anything that's particularly difficult about that? I, I don't really know, to be honest. Um, I did spot, I think there's somebody's done a port of Flask. Um, but it just seemed like, uh, like I was already feel like I've been learning a bunch as, as a a web developer, all this kind of bytes and stuff is a bit, a bit odd to me. Um, so I feel like I've been learning a lot, but then I started looking at um, async web framework options and I was like, oh, I don't have time for this. So I just went with the, the Flask approach, which seemed simple enough. Um, but yeah, I've actually been kind of regretting that in a way because I, I then ended up writing my own REST framework on top of Flask, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so ideally what I want is an async IO REST framework because I can just do the UI all in JavaScript, that would be much nicer. Hey, uh, you said something about a gas meter reading just now, uh, about an idea of looking at it with a webcam. I don't know if your gas meter is also from the 20s, then you're probably out of luck, but usually these meters have like an infrared uh, beep like for every cubic meter. Or oh, okay. Uh, so you can look into that. Uh. Cool, I'll, I'll take a look at The one extra issue I have is my gas meter is outside. Um, so there's like weather considerations, but... Well, RF, right? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, have, a, I'll have a look. <laughs> Thanks. Cool. Do you have any support for like motion sensors or...? Uh, yeah, um, so there's... Um, 
the the company that makes the uh, switches and the sockets, they've also got actually loads of people make them, but I've got some from the same company, the uh, PIR sensors. Um, I'm I'm not doing a huge amount with them yet, so that's still kind of work in progress. But yeah, I'm, so I, in my the one thing I've got is in the hallway. I'm turning on the light when it's um, dark, and it, so if you're like going to the loo at night time, the lights turn on for you. That's quite, that's the that's my my girlfriend's most favorite feature. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, well, thank you, Dougal. That's been interesting. Oh, well, we've got another one. Sorry. Hi, a less nomadic question. Uh, if you uh, would have choice Python 2.7, which technologies would you have choice? For example, um, for the library. Yeah, so if I'd done it in 2.7, I would probably went with Twisted, um, simply because they have got serial support included in the, the Twisted standard library. I, I don't know what they call it. Um, so that would have been a lot easier. Um, I, I ended up having to kind of figure out a bunch of stuff there, which I, I wasn't too familiar with. Um, so yeah, Twisted would have been a good choice, I think. Well, you've certainly provoked some interest there. <laughs> I, I expect all the Euro Pythonistas will have their houses automated next year. Yep. If anyone else wants to try my code out, as I say, it's all on GitHub, so I'd be happy to help anyone, because um, it is good fun. Thank you, and 12.30, I accept. <laughs>